the the, the overall capacity of predicting uh, quantities of interest. Okay, so uh, first of all, yeah, I've got to introduce the, the topic uh, with, um, with the why, basically, why, why do we do this? And um, I think, yeah, we've reached a stage where we now know um, a lot more than we used to in terms of how biological cells actually work. Uh, but still, you know, the more we know, then probably the more we don't know because there's so much nonlinear behavior and so many uh, cross uh, sort of cross talks and aspects that are influencing one another. And and there, there's also now um, cheaper and cheaper uh, collection of omics data, which give uh, many levels of understanding on, on our cells. Uh, but still, I think we, we still have some a lack of, uh, of mechanistic understanding of what's, what's really going on inside our cells. And this is, I think, very important, uh, well, both in biology and also in biomedicine. Uh, whenever we, we want to make a prediction with a model, I think we have to try our best to explain it, why, why we get that prediction. It doesn't matter if it's really accurate or it's, it's really... Uh, encouraging compared to the past, but I firmly believe we should try to explain it as much as we can from a biological point of view. Uh, so that's the overall, let's say, motivation uh, behind uh, what we do here. So, uh, well, you, you, you know this, uh, of course, but uh, the, you know, metabolism is the set of biochemical reactions in, in, in any living cell. And I think it was once considered um, almost a result of, uh, of a cellular state, but now it's increasingly being recognized as uh, a contributor or, or definitely a main player in, in cell behavior. Uh, there are many questions, of course, around, around, um, around metabolism. And you know, the, the key ones are around predictions. So could we predict a given phenotype? Or could we perhaps redirect uh, some metabolites towards desired products. And if we want to do so, should we change our, our medium composition? Uh, should we do some uh, genetic modification like knockouts or overexpression or partial knockdowns perhaps? And yeah, the overall uh, goal is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, could we potentially get some mechanistic uh, understanding of what's going on? And, not just correlation or cross-talks, but uh, causal, causal insights. So if we change something, this happens. One way of uh, modeling uh, metabolic systems is uh, it's called FBA, uh, flux balance analysis. Uh, I won't go uh, you know, into, into the technical details, but uh, I thought, oh, I was just mentioned that it's based on, on linear algebra and it's based on uh, coding uh, a set of biochemical reactions into a matrix. So simply, uh, we, we, we could build a matrix based on metabolites and the reactions in our, in our system uh, from biochemistry books. So just taking the available knowledge um, in biochemistry. Uh, and then we would form um, a linear system then starting from differential equations to, to model the flow of metabolites um, through this network. Um, let me see if I can um, make some pointer here. Maybe helpful. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, the goal would be to uh, model the flow of these, uh, of the, well, the flux really, so the flow of metabolites. In this case, it's just a glycolysis, but we'd like to, um, to predict the, the weight of each single reaction. So that would be the final goal of, um, of this metabolic modeling approach. And this is done through well, some steady state approximations and some uh, approximation of differential equations, which make the system tractable from um, from a mathematical and computational point of view. 
uh, what happens uh, in practice is um, is the same thing that happens when we have uh, things like well waterfalls or places where perhaps we'd like to know how fast water is uh, falling from upstairs and also maybe how fast water is, is flowing downstairs uh, but we want to focus on a small part so in this case if we focus on from here like the central part of the waterfall we can have a very good uh, estimate uh, of the uh, speed of, of the water right coming from here and also going there just by looking at how quickly water is flowing through this particular you know, portion of our space. So that's in general the idea of this mathematical modeling of metabolic systems, trying to, to capture the flow of metabolites by looking at specific portions of the, of the network. Uh, yeah, a bit of uh, mathematical um, aspects here. Um, the, the, the advantage of having uh, this all this uh, behavior coded into a linear system is that we can use uh, additional constraints and the most common constraints come from uh, of course the growth media so we'd like to impose some given growth medium or we'd like to say that some nutrients are not available uh, which is what happens all the time or maybe we, we want to overproduce something so we give a little bit more glucose and we have to code this into the, the network but also um, we can uh, code encode some uh, omics uh, related data. So for example, if we have transcriptomics uh, like gene expression or proteomics, we can, uh, for, for single proteins or single genes, we can say, you know, this is the expected quantity for this gene, this is the expected concentration for this metabolite and the expected, expected abundance for this protein. So let's constrain our model to take this into account. And this is done through uh, simple additional constraints to our problem, our mathematical formulation. Uh, we can also establish some objectives. And the most common one is biomass, for example, when, when our goal is to make sure our, uh, let's say bacteria or, or cells, uh, of course, they, they have to grow, first of all. So we'd like to maximize the biomass um, formation but you know, in many cases, we also have secondary objectives. So we can uh, optimize some, uh, some given compound for, for biotherapeutics or for other industrial purposes. Um, and well, in, in cases where we are modeling more than one uh, organism, like in biofilms, for example, or, or in, uh, in general microbial systems, uh, we would like to perhaps optimize the uh, biofilm information or the uh, in a way, happiness of all the, uh, the species together. So just to say that we can encode uh, both constraints in terms of homics and uh, growth media, but also we can encode objectives that ourselves should be uh, fulfilling. Okay, this is the uh, size really of these models. So although I only showed one a linear pathway in here, like this is, uh, before, but uh, this is the real uh, size of these models. You can probably only see the TCA cycle here, central bit, and then there's yeah, thousands of reactions. Uh, this is actually a human, a human, generic human model, um, which can be named tissue specific. Uh, but yeah, now the size is becoming massive, so with, with more than 13,000 reactions and then 3,000 genes. Um, mostly, of course, are metabolic, so these are only for the metabolic part. And uh, this is a pretty good coverage of metabolic genes in these models. Um, yeah, the important thing is that those constraints, uh, while in, let's say, microbiology, uh, we, we make models condition-specific or uh, medium-specific in, um, in the case of human health. Of course, we have to make them a uh, tissue specific. What can be uh, done with this? So a few, a few goals uh, could be uh, what I usually call forward prediction. So these, for example, were um, I think 460, uh, roughly 460 growth conditions for uh, E. coli. Uh, there were well, different uh, oxygen uh, condition, oxygen uptake, but also uh, 
other uh, media media compensation, different media compensation. And you know, one, let's say, uh, straightforward task uh, will be to predict uh, how much uh, biomass we're able to, to create uh, with this, with each of these conditions. So each point here is, is a condition. And also for each condition, how much acetate, for example, we could aim to produce. Um, so that this would be uh, one, one way to use these models, you know, creating our uh, conditions, encoding them, and running the model to predict all the, uh, the flux rates for the reactions, so the production rates for metabolites, for example. But then there is probably a more interesting uh, aspect, in my opinion, which is um, what I call the reverse optimization. So uh, most, uh, in most cases, we, we already have some goal in mind, uh, which could be, again, biomass maximization or a byproduct uh, minimization or, or maximization. Uh, so we can take this uh, opposite angle. We can ask our model, could you find all those potential uh, conditions or all, all the nutrients, maybe composition, nutrient availability, that would be optimal for us to reach uh, a specific uh, outcome. And maybe it could be, I don't know, average biomass, but then a reasonable, reasonable production of succinate. So once we choose the, our region of interest, in a way, what we'd like to uh, go with our model, we can ask our, our uh, model and our optimization algorithms to find um, conditions, uh, growth conditions, but also uh, genetic modification perhaps uh, that would uh, facilitate uh, when reaching a specific goal. Um, and again, these modifications uh, could be also encoded in, in the model in terms of uh, gene knockouts or, or uh, overexpression or, or knockdowns. So in a way, we, we have some goals uh, that are fully biological, and we try to uh, reverse engineer our model to, uh, to find all the potential inputs uh, in order to reach a specific output goal. And this is also done with uh, optimization algorithms in combination with uh, these mathematical metabolic models. Uh, what usually happens uh, if we do this uh, approach is that um, objectives are, are conflicting. And uh, I'm sure you, you found this many times uh, when you try to uh, grow something and uh, let the organism produce something else at the same time. It's not that easy to, to obtain both. There's always a trade-off to be found. Uh, and so a, a pot potential uh, application is also to explore um, let's say all the potential trade-off uh, positions when we have two contrasting objectives in mind. Um, one of them is usual, uh, usually the yeah, growth biomass, but the other could be any um, quantity or, or compound of, of interest. Of course, this could be extended to more than two uh, because the mathematical formula is, is always the same and also the computational solution behind it, which is the optimization algorithm. Well, we'll find what, what's called usually Pareto optimal uh, solutions, which are basically trade offs between contrasting objectives. Okay, so this is the modeling part. Now, uh, the other, the second, let's say, part of what we do is um, combining this modeling, metabolic modeling part, with machine learning uh, algorithms. Um, well, for those who are not uh, familiar with machine learning, the goal is to take some data from past experience. Uh, so for example, uh, we, have, we have tried, uh, let's say, uh, 1,000 previous uh, gene knockouts in, um, in East, which is an example I'll, I'll mention later. And we, we learn something or, or we collect data. So we, we know for each gene knockout uh, how fast or how slow uh, the growth of, um, of East is, is affected. So once we get this uh, historical data, the goal of machine learning is to predict what would happen if we have a new modification. So basically learning from, from uh, what we have to predict something that, uh, that will happen if we do something different. 
So yeah, learning from past experience to, to predict a potential future, uh, future cases. And in our case, uh, in this biomedical uh, case, it's not that straightforward because perhaps we have one goal in mind, which is usually on the y-axis, which could be growth, just to simplify. So let's say we'd like to predict growth for ourselves, but we have so much uh, potential predictors because uh, again, we have you know, growth media, we have uh, potential uh, omics data, uh, we have any known condition about the culture, or even batch effects, you know, different labs collecting different, uh, different you know, doing different experiments. So uh, yes, it, it is a machine learning task, but for this particular biomedical application, it's really challenging because you know, we have so much to, to put on the x-axis and things are interconnected. So thinking about even genes and proteins, they are somehow connected, maybe more, maybe less, depending on which um, organism we're talking about. But definitely we can't assume that we put everything into one pot and let our machine learning algorithm to, to do the prediction. Because the X variables are so many and also they are interconnected. So it's, it's important to do some uh, filtering and some pre-processing before. Okay, yeah, again, just very briefly, the two types of machine learning uh, are usually called unsupervised and supervised learning. And, and mainly the difference is that uh, with unsupervised learning, we, we don't have um, labels. So we can only uh, aim to extract some common features or some, uh, some patterns within the data, but we can't, um, we can't do predictions because we, we don't have anything to learn from. While with supervised learning, we can do predictions because the key difference is that the data we had um, was, was with labels, what's called labels, which is simply results of previous experiments. And this, of course, allows the model to make uh, predictions of results for future experiments. Because, of course, machine learning can't create anything from, from scratch. It has to be, it had to be some sort of um, previous knowledge on, on this these models. Another key uh, sort of statistical uh, consideration here is that um, we are in biology, we have um, again multiple uh, variables. I mean, these cartoons here are just, for example, the bioreactor growth medium or bioreactor perhaps physical conditions like temperature, pH, things like that. And also we have, for instance, the metabolic component. We can add more components here. We can add the transcriptomic component, proteomic component, and so on. But just to simplify, even if we only have two components that we are considering, uh, we, can't, we can't do like this. So we can't consider just one component, do prediction based on that, and then you know, think that, well, we actually have a second component. Let's adjust the predictions using the second component. So this doesn't work. Uh, and uh, there's a usual problem in statistics when we have biased uh, estimators of, uh, of the contributions of each of these components. So we should find a way to do this, to put everything together from the beginning to predict our variable of interest, which again, for, to simplify, we can assume it's a growth, growth rate of our culture. But this way we could get some unbiased estimators for our uh, contributions of each uh, omic to the, to the final answer. Yeah, so the, um, the question is how to consider, how to uh, take into account the biggest problem of this machine learning formulation, which is the interconnection between the uh, variables, the predictors. So this is, um, one, one of the things we, we try to solve with, uh, with networks and with further modeling on these, um, on these omics. Um, yeah, one, key, one easy example is the sort of fluxomic layer, which is the metabolic uh, reaction rate, and the genomic layer or the transcriptomic layer, 
which is of course the abundance or the uh, expression of genes. And we can't assume they are independent. So this is the key problem. We can't say well, these two things are entirely uh, different information because yes, there will be some, um, some new information in, in maybe the, the meta metabolic network, but part of it will come from the transcripts. So that of course, there's a clear biological connection between genes, proteins, and, and enzymes and metabolites. So the, one approach is to use network uh, theory and graphs to, um, to model this particular uh, connection or relationship and try to encode this, um, this structure into the machine learning um, algorithm. As an overall um, pipeline, uh, of what we do usually uh, is uh, starting from uh, all, all the information we have basically, uh, usually yeah, growth medium, uh, composition, and then uh, any omics available, transcriptomics and proteomics, and if available, any condition specific uh, parameter or any sample specific information. Uh, now, uh, even a sing I mean, if we consider single um, single features, it still uh, works fairly well. So having, uh, of course, two of them or three of them is, is, uh, is brilliant, but also we've done many uh, applications where only one of these things was available. But uh, what we tend to do is to, um, yes, consider the data in the first place, but also map the, these data onto uh, the metabolic networks I mentioned earlier. Uh, why, why is that? Because we have information already, brilliant information from measurements, but we can have this for free. So we can simply map anything we have onto the available metabolic model. And for free, without any experiment, we get the predictions on the flux rates for the, the metabolic network. So we can build a metabolic map and try to already understand what's going on inside. So this is one thing, it, of course, it helps us uh, understanding what's going on, but it gives new information uh, for, for the, the, the rest of the pipeline, which is the machine learning bit. Because then taking this information from the metabolic flux, considering the original information on the uh, growth medium or the uh, omics, we could combine everything together into uh, all sorts of predictions of Yes, pathway uh, or uh, utilization or uh, any culture behavior or any formation of biofilm, whatever our, outcome, our outcome is. Uh, in this sense, choosing the outcome is, is um, independent from the machine learning algorithm. Of course, it will change a lot uh, how, the, how the algorithms are trained, but we can choose any sort of reasonable biological outcome for these tasks. So, uh, yeah, this is what I just mentioned. So we could do uh, many uh, these things in, in many uh, ways. I mean, one way could be to generate the metabolic models and then use the flux rates to get some uh, supervisor and supervised learning. Perhaps we, we would just like to uh, separate two different uh, cases in our culture, or maybe let's say in cancer, we'd like to separate healthy cells from uh, cancer cells. So we could also have a binary outcome. And then, uh, of course, you know, it's, not that, it's not always like this because many times we have some, uh, some variable to predict. But it can be both ways. It can be a, a, some sort of clinical or a binary outcome or even you know, viable cell culture or not a viable cell culture. Or it could be some, uh, some quantity of interest, like again, both ways. Um, the multi-omic version of this is uh, using the flux rates to get some understanding and also to be combined with the initial multi-omic data available from experiments, again, to get the same predictions. And then we have a third option, which is um, getting the multi-omic data in the first place, doing some prediction just based on that, and then, only then, we uh, build the models depending on different outcomes for these predictions. So yeah, we have 
basically many ways to combine these these two things: uh, the modeling aspect, the metabolic modeling aspect, with the machine learning aspect. Yeah, I'll go through um, a few case studies um, just to, to give uh, some examples uh, of how this could be used. So the um, the first example is uh, sim simply mapping um, data onto models and uh, spotting uh, classes of of, uh, of models. This is extremely helpful for, for clinical, mainly for clinical studies, um, or when you have maybe two clear conditions like yeah, normoxia or hypoxia. So simply change the oxygen level. Uh, you, we we can map these onto the model and see. Uh, and plot also the differences in terms of metabolic network. So here it's an entirely different um, way of using the TCA cycle and the glycolysis and the, the, the pentose phosphate pathway as well. Uh, one um, other application is to combine this with, um, with carbon modeling. This might be relevant for, um, for some of you who are interested in, in ecological uh, modeling. Uh, in this case, what we did is um, to model first, uh, in a fairly uh, basic way, um, the sort of food web in the Adriatic Sea. And then we, we wanted to use, um, to test these metabolic models, uh, specifically Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas putida. Uh, we wanted to test the capacity for a bioremediation uh, from, uh, from the metabolic network to see how much um, PCB in this case, we could bioremediate it with, with the metabolic modeling aspect. And again, trying to, uh, to follow uh, the flow of uh, metabolites through this bioremediation process in the Pseudomonas uh, cell. Uh, in terms of, uh, of cancer or um, let's say clinical data in general, um, we could use similar techniques. Now, here, of course, it's even more challenging because um, for transcriptomics, we have to take into account the splice isoforms, but human, human genomics is, is a lot more complex. Uh, but still, we can, uh, we can map uh, these onto uh, on the usually a generic human reconstruction, and then we make it tissue-specific. Like in this case, um, we did something uh, with a breast uh, breast cancer specific uh, metabolic network. The goal here is what, was to map um, the Warburg effect, so what happens in cancer cells versus uh, non-cancer cells, healthy cells, trying to characterize the behavior from a full uh, metabolic point of view. In this, in this case we used the model I showed you at the very beginning, the massive model with yeah, 13,000 reactions, so we could literally track even peripheral and pathways, um, and there was quite a significant change in some pathways which we, we were expecting, and then some something else which um, which we didn't expect. So it was quite interesting to see the differences. Uh, yeah, in terms of uh, still still cancer uh, cancer modeling, um, another option uh, is to map this uh, different omics data from different cancer cells to spot uh, only the differences. So only to align to the differences uh, in, in metabolic uh, patterns, uh, which again is not easy um, because it's, uh, it's, it's a massive network. So sometimes, even if something seems to be different, there has to be some sort of uh, statistical or machine learning underlying validation to make sure that what we see is really statistically uh, different. And so in this case, although there is a lot of difference, then the really significant difference is only for two cancer types against the others. And only after we modeled the metabolic, um, the metabolic network, because these were not uh, apparent from the transcriptomics. But this is also a key um, interesting uh, result in my opinion with these models and machine learning. We can identify things that are different only after we map um, the omics onto the metabolic network. For some reason that are also sometimes obscure because machine learning is not easy to interpret. But if we, if we generate these uh, flux metabolic features, which we can do for free, as I mentioned earlier, 
we could better distinguish things uh, downstream, for example. And a uh, very, very, uh, very helpful case is when we have um, some uh, well biomarkers or, or things we like to identify that could tell us uh, with very high probability only by looking at maybe top five or the top 10 biomarkers, which could be reactions, could be genes. But we like to look only at a very short list of, um, of biomarkers and decide with very high accuracy whether, for example, we are, we are looking at a breast cancer cell or a heavy cell, or maybe a metastatic or a non-metastatic cancer cell. So the machine learning, uh, this is where it's really helpful because after we do all the metabolic modeling stuff, we'd like to extract some key features and a very, very uh, small set of features that could, could uh, tell us uh, how to uh, classify different uh, cell behaviors. And um, another interesting uh, application is the uh, simultaneous gene accounts, because uh, there are many occasions where even if we take genes in isolation and we uh, yeah, we turn them off or we do something with, genes, with, with those genes. In isolation, we don't observe uh, any major change. But actually, if we, um, if we trigger them uh, together at the same time, like a double gene account, for example, then that's when we see some, some big change. So identifying these um, double gene accounts or combined gene modifications in general is um, it's a really difficult task because you can imagine with thousands and thousands of genes, if we, if we are looking at pairs of genes, then we have thousand times thousands of pairs of genes. So it explodes really quickly. We have so many combinations we can look at. And that's why these models can be uh, extremely helpful in shortlisting and finding the most interesting pairs or, or triples of genes, for example, to, uh, to look at what we'd like to uh, trigger things together. Uh, we all, yeah, we also did uh, fairly recently um, uh, a case on uh, a case study on aging, trying to uh, predict um, aging with uh, immune cells, with CD4 cells. Um, it was quite quite an interesting project. Almost we started this for for fun because we saw there is um, what's called a transcriptomic age predictor. So based on your uh, transcriptomic profiles, there are fairly accurate. Um, methods that would uh, predict your age um, and uh, of course given other yeah clinical uh, variables etc so we thought uh, let's try this with with the metabolic models so let's try to generate as usual our metabolic models from the transcriptomic profiles of the cd4 cells and let's see whether we could also get a metabolic age predictor which is what we did and it, it was it was uh, yeah it was was also very, very promising. Uh, so generating these metabolic features, both to get a better prediction, but also to, uh, to see immune cell behavior and to justify immune cell behavior from a metabolic perspective. Uh, we did a few uh, industry-related uh, projects. Uh, this was with uh, CPI in, in Darwin, the Center for Process Innovation. They were mainly interested in um, predicting lactate production uh, from Cho cells, uh, the Chinese hamster ovary cells, uh, which is one of the most popular for, for biotherapeutics and for uh, post-translational modifications in, in drugs and proteins in general. Uh, and again, what we saw here is that um, if we predict lactate production just with genes, gene expression, we get a fairly low error. This is the error on the y-axis, so we'd like to minimize this. So gene expression only gets a fairly low error. Uh, if we only consider metabolism, so only fluxes, we get uh, actually a higher, a higher error. So it's worse to consider um, metabolism here than genes. But if we combine them with, with machine learning, that's where we get uh, a much lower combined error on the prediction. So th this um, it was one of the first few examples where we showed that uh, fluxes from metabolic networks in isolation are less accurate than gene expression. But if we combine them, we improve a lot the uh, predictive power of gene expression. 
And these are quite interesting, especially for production of a secondary uh, metabolite. Uh, a second case study uh, was again on Pseudomonas cutida. In this case, we put a non-native pathway from a Pseudomonas aeruginosa into Pseudomonas cutida. So we modeled this non-native pathway because the goal for this company was to um, overproduce rhamnolipids. Uh, and well, bisulfurfant in general, but in this case, it was uh, overproduction of rhamnolipids. So the question was, how can we redirect our metabolic uh, flow? to make sure we maximize the rhamnolipid formation in pseudomonas. This was again done with a combination of optimization algorithms and machine learning models. With Fujifilm, uh, this is still ongoing. Uh, we are trying to uh, predict uh, the best uh, growth conditions for uh, maximizing the titer uh, for E. coli. In this case, it's E. coli. And uh, again, we've, we've been experimenting many uh, different machine learning approaches. Um, yeah, as usual with flux rates coming from the metabolic model to improve and to explain the prediction from the, from the machine learning data. Uh, this is uh, something we're working as well now. Uh, this is on uh, Synecrococcus. So yeah, it's a microalgae. And um, the goal here is to identify in, uh, in 24 different conditions uh, with uh, the transcriptomics data and the metabolic model. We'd like to identify uh, or to differentiate conditions based on the, uh, well, the photosynthesis potential, but also the, the biomass. And we, we are currently mapping three sets of objectives, uh, which are considering the ATP maintenance and the photosystem one and two. In 24 conditions, um, based on uh, mostly stress conditions. So trying to see what happens inside uh, the Synecococcus strain uh, this year. So also trying to map the full metabolic network, the, well, the full network known so far, because there are still some unknowns in the metabolic network for Synecococcus. But considering the full network we, we have so far, we are trying to differentiate conditions on, on different levels always trying to uh, identify which pathways are active in which condition. In terms of microbial community, which is another very interesting aspect uh, in well, bioremediation, ecological modeling, but also uh, well, gut, gut modeling and human health. Uh, this is also an ongoing project with, with the University of Hull um, and it's looking at uh, trying to uh, map um, the microbial uh, community in our gut and trying to, mm, to model uh, community behavior and uh, equilibria uh, among all different species and human cells as well, of course, being our gut. And uh, we're trying to address this with also evolutionary or social uh, considerations um, because this is what is likely to happen in, in our gut and every time there is a microbial community, there is some sort of trade-off and social considerations where uh, you know, different species are trying to help each other or sometimes to fight each other. But there's a very interesting um, interplay between these different social behaviors and cells. Um, how, yeah, how do we extract this information? And usually once we uh, generate the flux rates from the metabolic model, and we consider also the input from the gene expression, the original gene expression. We have uh, a few, few approaches we try uh, every time and we usually have to uh, create our, our own uh, new approach for every single data set. But the idea, the overall high level idea is that we, um, we take all the inputs and we try to uh, compress it into a sort of latent uh, space, a latent set of variables um, which hopefully uh, is not losing information. And we test this by simply recreating our original data, starting only from the hidden information we've extracted. So if we recreate the original data, just starting from a subset, well, we almost recreate, let's say, we recreate with a good level of accuracy, then we're happy and we go ahead. So we have now obtained a small set of uh, variables that we take forward. 
will be uh, the best for the analysis. This is actually really important, especially because um, on the practical level, these things have entirely different formats or entirely different ranges, entirely different uh, experimental settings. So when people measure, yeah, protein expression, gene expression, and it's usually different groups or different uh, time points. So we have to do a lot of uh, normalization and uh, filtering for this. So this is one of, of the reasons why we have to do this pre-processing on the initial, initial features. Uh, this was yeah, one of the latest uh, case studies we did on, on East. Uh, as I mentioned, we were trying to predict growth rate on uh, single knockout and double knockout strains. Uh, actually, what we did uh, is that we trained our machine learning method and metabolic model on single knockout strains. So we learned uh, this data. Um, we predicted um, predicted unseen data on single knockout strains with, with very, very good uh, accuracy. And then we also tried uh, to get an entirely different data set, which we, we had never seen before, uh, based on double knockout strains. So entirely unknown to the machine learning model. And we just applied what we learned on single knockouts on uh, double knockout strains. And also we got uh, a reasonable, uh, fairly, very good uh, predictive accuracy without having seen anything about this data set at all, just based on the previous model. And we had to develop the custom architecture for this to, to create this with, uh, with deep learning in this case. So it was neural networks. Uh, so in terms of, uh, well, future work really, uh, we, are, uh, we are still developing models for and methods for integrating omics data and metabolic networks because, as I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, I personally, I really believe that uh, because, yes, we use machine learning, but we strongly uh, make use of metabolic networks to explain the machine learning predictions. So we always uh, print and, and create a map of the metabolic network for each condition because we'd like to see why some um, reactions or some genes are predicted to be um, optimal in some cases. And um, the second more methodological um, interest we have is on the um, on building these neural network architectures or the machine learning architectures, you know, assuming we'd like to predict the growth rate, one single thing, then we usually have like two or three things like gene expression, maybe proteins, protein abundance, and metabolic fluxes. So there is always a methodological issue all the time and mathematical issue, how to combine these things together. Because there will be a point where we have to put them together to get our prediction for the growth rate. But where is this point? That's the main question. And also, should they have some individual training first and then combine them? Should they be together from the beginning? Should we use some pre-training on, on one, uh, one, one set of features, maybe learning from previous things, like, like what they do in image recognition, for example, where they, they learn uh, recognizing images from one data set. And then for a new data set, they hope to use a little bit of that learning process instead of starting from scratch, which is what we do naturally as well. You know, we learn from past things and we are presented with an entirely new challenge in our daily life, we basically hope to learn a bit from what we know, even from entirely unrelated challenges. So that's, that's also what machine learning can do, and that's uh, a concrete possibility in these cases. Uh, it's usually, this is usually called transfer learning. When you learn something on one task, and you hope to a little bit use this on uh, an entirely different task. So anyway, just to say, yeah, that there is the, this is the main methodological challenge, how to build this learning framework. Okay, just to, to, to wrap up, um, I think the, yeah, the, main, the main reasons why uh, we, we map these omics uh, data and the growth conditions onto a model is first of all, yeah, to, to see what's happening, this is the main goal, but also because we found that 
it usually works as um, a noise reduction tool or a filtering approach on uh, many times where genes seem to indicate something that is not really there. And it might be for maybe experimental um, problems or, or, or simply because uh, the high expression of a gene does not uh, translate into a uh, high expression of the enzyme and of the metabolic reaction. So these are very helpful to, to spot these uh, false positives in a way. And many times, you know, when, when we build hubs or networks of genes, we have genes that seem to be central, seem to be important, but then when we map them onto the network, the corresponding uh, reaction is not really that important. And this is also why uh, these models are, are very helpful sometimes. And um, yeah, what I mentioned in terms of variables, it can be many things. So we can have you know, physiological conditions or, or patient information in case of human cells. We have yeah, metabolic measurements, uh, growth medium, transcriptomics, proteomics, whatever available, or even you know, flux rates if, if they've been measured with uh, you know, carbon-13 or flux, flux analysis, although this is still really expensive nowadays. So but it is, it is also another option. Um, and the, yeah, the overall goals is what, what we mentioned throughout the presentation. So first of all, uh, you know, achieve a mechanism aware machine learning uh, tool where we could, yes, do predictions, but also explain them, uh, even sometimes looking at the, the metabolic network and the flux rates. Um, and then, yeah, identify perhaps some biomarkers or shortlist some, some key components of our network that seem to have a key effect on, on output. And on the machine learning side, uh, the goal is to learn and to handle uh, a huge number of features, especially from many biological domains. So the challenge is how to uh, put them together into a single predictive framework. Okay, yeah, that, that's it really. I just wanted to thank yeah, the funders and uh, yeah, especially my group who's been doing a lot of hard work as well. So, and thanks to you for your attention.